Hello, and welcome back to our playthrough of Escape Velocity Nova. Today we'll be taking a look at the Wild Geese storyline. Now, some of you may know that the Wild Geese storyline can be a lead-in to either the Pirate or Auroran storylines. However, that is not always the case, because it is possible for it to terminate without leading into a major storyline. This is the so-called Knight of the Red Branch path, and it is determined entirely by chance, as best as I can tell. But it's pretty interesting, and it rewards the player with an accolade that you'll carry with you through the rest of the game, in addition to a small salary. So, this is just a generic pilot. I've equipped it with uh, vectored thrust, hail chain guns, thunderhead lances, and all the usual stuff that we usually like to put on these ships. It has every Sigma upgrade and a pirate jammer. The idea being that we are not here to talk about ship builds, we just want a ship that will carry us through the Wild Geese storyline with a minimum of hassle. It was not a storyline where you have to do any combat, but it is helpful because you have to go to some pretty rough and tumble places. So this is Samantha, it's the UN shipping person. We're just going to go ahead and say no to her request. Uh, this is Temin Shard, he's the private investigator. We're going to go ahead and say no to his request. And we're not going to have the Wild Geese trigger at this time. They can only trigger from the soul bar, and so we're going to have to try to get that to fire by landing here on Mars, and then it's going back and forth back to Earth. It's a pretty high chance to fire, actually, and people who play the game might get sick of seeing it when you're trying to trigger other storylines. But here it is. You have barely entered the bar when you are knocked backwards by the flying body of one of the bar's patrons. The burly individual knocks you to the ground, and as you stand up to give the offensive ruffian a piece of your mind, if not a piece of your boot, he knows that the man was sent flying your way by a red-bearded giant fighting on the far side of the bar. As you watch, a number of men attack him, only to be beaten back by his prestigious strength. Or prodigious strength. A man comes at him from behind, smashing a bar stool over his head. He staggers and begins to stumble. His sneaky attacker begins to draw a knife, and you feel as if you should help the man before he is stabbed in the back in a cowardly attack. You quickly jump into action, smashing your fist into the other man's face. He falls backwards as your fist comes away stained with blood. The giant shakes his head and with a roar launches himself at the remaining ruffians. As you watch, the fight ends in a quick and brutal flurry of blows. In a matter of seconds, the floor is strewn with unconscious bodies. The man turns to you and offers his huge hand. Thanks for your help, he says in a thick brug. Can I get you a drink? I am not going to do the accent. It would not be in good taste. You nod your assent and he turns to a dazed looking barman and orders two drinks. You make a mental note not to drink in dockside bars anymore, and turn your attention to the man beside you. He stands about six and a half feet tall and looks as if he could pull leviathans apart with his bare hands. He has a shock of bright red carrot colored hair and very pale skin. He turns to you and hands you a huge drink, as black as pitch and as thick as fresh cream. That's gotta be a Guinness. He raises his glass to you in a silent salute and takes a long pull on his drink. You follow suit and are surprised by the thick, bitter taste that fills your mouth. It is at once revolting and enticing, and you don't quite know what to make of it. You guess that you should be polite and finish it, but you don't know if you'll be able. Many hours later, you and your new friend, Micklin Hugh, stagger from the bar. The manager slams the door behind you and locks it quickly, and you get the distinct impression that he was not happy that the two loudest patrons were also the last to leave. You head back towards the docks, when Mickleen curses loudly. You follow his gaze as best you can, and see a heavily modified Thunderhead being locked down by the port authorities. Mickleen shouts pieces at them in a strange tongue, but it makes no difference. Before they leave, they give him a notice to the effect that he has outstanding storage debts, and that his ship was impounded until he pays them back. Ah, but that would be the life of a wild rover, he sighs wistfully, waving an unsteady hand at his locked ship. I spent all my money on whiskeys and beer, and now I've got nothing to get my ship out of hook. He slumps down next to the ship and puts his head in his hands. Your heart goes out to him, and you ask if there's any way you can help him. He explains that he has to be in New Ireland in the Tautha system before the end of the month, so he can be the best man in his cousin's nuptials. He says that if you give him a lift, you can stay for the wedding and the party after. Apparently one is very serious, and the other involves a white dress. You've had far too many pints to figure out which is which. Do you give him a lift? Yeah, of course we do. You wake in the morning with a heavy head, and there is far too much light in the cabin. The instruments are too bright, and you can't remember ever feeling quite so awful. McLean doesn't appear to be much better, but takes a very philosophical view of your predicament. Just remember, you can only start to feel better when you feel this bad at the beginning. He tells you with grim humor. Somehow, it does make sense, in a bizarre way. Alright, 
So the Tautha system is only three jumps away. It is also coincidentally part of one of the best trading routes in the game. But we're not going to be doing that. These generic pilots that I've made have plenty of cash on them. But it is nice and close by. For whatever reason, um, I'm not well liked in the system, but that's going to change as a result of doing the storyline. The wedding turns out to be a very loud and jolly affair. The rites were solemn and beautifully written, and the sentiment of love and attorneys spent together brings a tear to your eye. McLean's cousin, Riley Shaskian, is so happy that you've delivered his errant cousin that he places you at the place of honor at the reception, between his unmarried and beautiful sister, Sinead, and his best friend and brother, Sean Sh Saskian. The night seems endless and full of drink and song, fights and dancing. Men vie for the attention of the ladies, who treat them with a faintly mocking humor. Their tongues move like whips, and you find your sights hurting from laughing at their banter. McLean tries to teach you old drinking songs, and Sinead tries to teach you to dance. What well, seems to be only a few short hours, the night is over. You stagger away to McLean's place to pass into a blissful sleep full of dreams of quick-witted women and quicker-fisted men. Alright, so we have a lovely after-party. Morning finds you in a small bed in the home of McLean. You see him enter the room with a huge plate of steaming food, which makes your fragile stomach form a couple of small flips. He thrusts it under your nose and insists that you eat. As you weakly push the food down your gullet, McLean tells you that all the young men in town must go to the bride's family home and collect her dowry, so they can deliver it to the newlyweds, and you've been invited to help. In fact, he says through a mouthful of his own breakfast, I've been told not to show up unless I have you in tow. You readily agree and spend another very enjoyable day in the company of these strange and hospitable folk. And then if you go back to the bar, you can trigger the next part. You and McLean are sitting in the bar, and you are considering how easy it would be to stay here and drink for the rest of your life. You notice that McLean has not had to work a single day that you've been here. So far, all he has done is swan about and drink in pubs. You ask him why he doesn't seem to have to pay for anything, and he looks at you in surprise. Why, don't you know who we are here in New Ireland? He answers, slightly surprised. We're the Wild Geese, the best mercenary organization in the universe. We fight for the best pay and the best causes, and we never lose. I'm one of the geese, so I'm more responsible for the income of New Ireland than many others here. So tradition has it I don't pay for grog, or food, nor lodgings either. You see, there's a good chance I will die in the service of New Ireland's economy, so I don't pay for taxes or services. Cover any debt when I die. You ask him further about the geese, and you realize that most of the famous battles of the past have had geese somewhere in the field. They have a long tradition of being the savior of their employer's troops, and when the day is all but lost, and most men are ready to break, the wild geese find a special reserve and push on, often winning the day single-handedly. At least that is the way that Mikaline tells it. By the time he has finished his explanations, many of the other patrons have begun telling their stories. They all involve fighting, women, and lots of drinking. By the time you leave the bar, you have a deep wish you'd have been fortunate enough to be born on New Ireland, or the sole homeworld, Ireland itself. At least then you could lay claim to this rich tradition of warriors and heroes. You tell Mikaline, who laughs until his face hurts. Musha, he waggles a finger at you. If you talk like that, that'll cause folks to not let you leave. If you stay long enough, you'll look and think and sound so much like us that a stranger won't know the difference. But unfortunately, I have to get back to Seoul and collect my ship. Can you take me back? Yeah, of course we can. I'm not sure what Musha means, but I assume it's some sort of uh, reproachment or reprisal. You tell McLean that you'd be happy to take him back. Next day, you head back to Seoul. All right. So this part is straightforward enough, but this is the... First of the two random events that you need to have fire correctly to get the Knight of the Red Branch. We need this next one to go our way. So let's see how this is going to shake out. You and Mickling land on the cane band with a minimum of fuss. It is odd that you get clearance so quickly. You have seen waits at least ten times longer than the one you had. Mickling is in high spirits, and together you set off to the impound office to arrange for Mickling's ship to be released. You are nearly there when you see a group of burly figures walk out of an alley ahead of you. They turn and wait for you to approach, and you glance over your shoulder. More men are there, and a sudden sweat breaks out on you, as cold as the pit of your stomach. They are all armed in some way. McLean stops and gives you an almost imperceptible nod. The hour is late. Traffic on the walkway is thin, made up mostly of the dregs of the port's population, the night walkers who only appear after most regular folk have gone to bed. There is little likelihood of outside intervention, and you are forced to let the other men make the first move. But soldiers, McLean whispers from the side of his mouth, they work for a black-hearted bastard named McGowan. He runs a pirate organization in the Galactic North. 
He has a lot of backing, too, mostly from the Bureau of Internal Investigation. Hard to prove, but still a fact. The big bastard in the middle is Bull John Pennant. He is McGowan's man in the sector, and a real piece of work, too. The only problem is I owe them money, and a lot of it. That and the fact that I betted with Pennant's wife. I don't like the look of this little party. I wonder why. McLean Hugh, you work worthless muck shoveler. Pennant steps forward, casting back his overcoat to reveal a sawn-off shot blaster. You have a lot of nerve showing your ugly face around here. We were tipped off you'd be dropping by, so I thought I'd get myself a little payback while I'm here. Boss wants his money as well. He starts to walk forward. The men behind you begin to close in. If I don't get out of this in one piece, McLean whispers urgently. Get back to New Ireland and find Eamon Flanagan. Tell him what happened, and that I'm sorry about this. The men behind you charge, and Pennant opens fire with his shot blaster. McLean pulls a hidden blaster from his cloak and returns fire, and you turn to face the charging men behind you. You fire at one of them, but you feel a sudden pain in your back. You fall into unconsciousness, and the ensuing blackness is the heaviest you've ever known. So now we get to see if we're going to be successful or not. When you regain consciousness, the area around you is covered with blood. Some of it is pooled in places, but all of it indicates that the bodies of the fallen have been removed. You lift your head and you see Mickleen. He is sitting slumped against a wall, covered in blood but smiling still. I've never seen that tactic before, he grins merrily, deliberately knocking yourself out to drip up the enemy. Maybe I can do that next time and you can take care of them after that. You smile and immediately wish you had not, as the skin across your face feels like it has been mashed with a mallet. Yeah, Mickleen laughed to your obvious discomfort. I've never seen someone headbutt another man's foot so hard. Very good thinking, though. You did break his foot. Nothing like using your head in a fight, as Flanagan always says. All right, so that was successful. Oh, well, he grimaces as he levers himself up and helps you to your feet. We better get back to New Ireland to inform the man himself of what has occurred, because I very much doubt McGowan will be prepared to leave this one alone. He looks surprised to hear the obvious trepidation in his tone. Finding Pennant and his lapdogs is one thing. He shakes his head, blood still dripping down his face from several cuts on his forehead. Telling Eamon Flanagan is another thing. You think I look bad now? Just wait until next time he drags me along to one of his training sessions. I'll be in the hospital for months. You don't think you get to be the leader of a mob as unruly as the wild geese without being able to crack together a few heads. He grunts as the two of you head back to your ship. Now do you? Despite the pain, you cannot help but grin at Mickleen and, and his wonderfully warped view of the universe. So McLean has survived, which means we are on the correct path for the Knight of the Red Branch. Eamon Flanagan, of course, features prominently in most of the storylines, I believe five out of six, and he is an amusing character. He is very long-winded, though, very verbose, and we're going to see that here. As you pile your way down through the atmosphere, you cannot help but notice a couple of deep energy discharge craters not far from the spaceport, and you wonder what has happened here. As soon as you land, McLean takes a deep breath to steady himself and motions you to follow him. Come on, he mutters, looking more cowed than you would have ever believed possible. We may as well get this over with. He leads you to a side building off of the spaceport and into what appears to be an office block. For the commander of a mercenary unit, you are surprised that this Flanagan has no personal bodyguards. But as you enter his office, you see him training with some other men in a side area. As you watch, you see the ten men rush him, only to be repulsed by him. He moves in a way that you have seen no other man ever move. He weaves around as if he's controlling their movements as well as his own, and that each step taken was part of some elaborate and painful dance. By the time you begin to piece together what your eyes are telling you, the man has moved on further. It is amazing to behold. Within moments he has defeated the men. You expected them to be smashed, broken, bloody, yet they stand, slowly for some, but they are not injured beyond possible bruises. Better, gentlemen. Much better. Now go and practice amongst yourselves. I have business to attend to. He turns and walks towards you. I can see you are impressed. Flanagan waves behind his head at the practice mat. The skills of a mercenary are varied. Some situations require force, others non-force. It is something I learned during my time with the Aurorans. The house Heron uses a specific style of martial arts, the Heron style. I'm a master, but I have started teaching my men here a variation of it. It is an amazing system. You nod in agreement and ask what the principal basis is. In learning Heron style, you are taught to read and direct the weave of combat. Subconsciously, all of us fight in a pattern and rhythm. Heron style teaches us to detect it and control it. It isn't so much that you defeat your opponent, but he defeats himself. You force the weave to do so. It's hard to explain, but once felt and mastered, 
It makes all combat easier, from one-on-one -on -one to mammoth battles between hundreds of ships. There is one teacher, Karlakar, to whom most promising students are sent. It is said that he imprints the ability to read and control the weave on his students subconsciously. This makes their weave unreadable, and therefore very dangerous. You nod, even though of what most of Flanagan has said escapes your understanding. So, he says, turning to Mickleen and eyeing him wryly, not twelve hours ago we beat off a well-planned and well-conducted raid by ships that appear to be untraceable, and then you come home looking like a whipped dog. Why am I not surprised? I told you to try to infiltrate McGowan's organization, I didn't mean you have to piss off all his lackeys in the process. Let me guess, you had a run-in with Pennant? Mickling nods, his eyes downcast. Alright, Flanagan nods as if having made a major decision. Meet me in the bar in a few hours, and I'll detail you a new set of orders. In the meantime, Mickling, go and get your training gear on. If you're going to get into all these fights, the least I can do is show you how to survive them without having to go through major surgery all the time. McLean sighs and despondently turns away, and you notice a quick smile crossing Flanagan's face. He looks at you and shakes his head after McLean leaves. There are days, he grins, still shaking his head, when I swear I could throttle that boy. If he wasn't so damn good at what he does, I'd reckon I probably would have by now. Regardless, he seems to have taken a shine to you, and whatever his faults are, he's a fine judge of character. If you want to drop by the bar as well, I could use you. If only to try to keep McLean from straying too far into the wilderness. Ah, uh, poor Mickleen. You are sitting quietly in a corner booth in the bar, when a man walks in and walks straight up to you. Iceman? He asks you in a lilting voice. You nod, noticing that the man is very heavily armed, carrying a sawn-off shot blaster, two heavy blaster pistols, and a laser rapier. I'm Flynn Breton. Eamon should be along soon, as should the others. Others? You wonder just what is going on when t another two men saunter towards you. They are identical with a shock of red hair. And are both very large. They nod a greeting to Flynn and sit down. Again, you notice the newcomers are heavily armed. I'm Sean O'Driscoll, says one of them, and this here is my brother Ryan. The other grunts and waves for two ales. No sooner do the drinks arrive than a slim, athletic woman approaches. She sits and begins to polish a throwing dagger. You introduce yourself, and she smiles shyly at you. I'm Tara, Tara Collins. I'm pleased to meet you. Don't mind her, Iceman, says Flynn. I've been told she talks more eventually, though I've known her for three years myself, and nary an errant word does she say to me. Tara shoots a wilting look at Flynn, who returned, and then returns to her blade. You're about to ask what's going on when Eamon Flanagan stalks into the bar, followed by three others, including a brow-beaten Mickleen. Ah, Iceman, I see you've already met the others. These with me make up the rest of the Wild Rovers. The Rovers are the closest thing the Wild Geese have to special forces. The eight people you see here are the most resourceful individuals on all New Ireland. They are used primarily as spies, but are also capable of demolition work, assassinations, anything really. Now, I've called them all here to outline a plan against Pennant and the sole sector branch of McGowan's organization. Emin goes over the background of the situation, of how McLean was tasked to infiltrate the organization and assess the strength and weaknesses, how he got into trouble when he owed the criminals a lot of money, and how they responded to, by trying to kill him. The rovers are quiet throughout the meeting, silently drinking their drinks and listening to Flanagan. You get the impression that at any other time they'd be a lot of fun, but that the current situation calls for a certain level of professionalism. Flanagan concludes his briefing with an outline of the plan to come. The rovers would separate and enter the soul system. Each two-man team would be responsible for the destruction of a different sphere of McGowan's organization. When each team has finished their tasks, they will return to New Ireland. Of course, we can always use another man, he says as he claps a hearty hand over your shoulder. You tell Flanagan you'd be honored to take part in the operation, and that you owe McGowan and his sidekick Pennant that much. In that case, he grins good-naturedly, I want you to go to Merrim in the Hartford system. Oh, sorry, the Hannaford system. Flynn will go with you, and he'll be in command of a team of our special operation commandos. When you get there, you will need to locate the wreck of a freighter called South of the Border. It crashed nearly 80 years ago on the icy steps. McGowan has made the wreck habitable again, and has been using it as a tobacco and hammerhead processing facility. It is a handy arrangement for McGowan. Merrim is close enough to Seoul that it doesn't take long to ship the product back. However, since Merrim doesn't have any official government, McGowan has been able to have a steady influx of income without worrying about police trouble. I want you two to go and fix the situation. All of the workers there are convicted criminals that McGowan has been able to secure as part of a government work contract. It is a good indication that the government cares little for the state of the criminal justice system. Terminate them. 
teach them the folly of dealing in destructive drugs. After that, meet me back here for the next phase of the operation. One final thing, he mutters, looking straight at you. As the new member of our team, if at any time things get too out of hand for us to survive here, look for my friend Professor F. Cook on the misfire, or on misfire in the Trishka system, and I won't be too far away. Alrighty. So we're going to head up to the Hannaford system, which, true to what Emin says, is pretty close to Seoul, just five jumps away, and deal with this freighter. Now, it's pretty interesting, because if you go and land on that system at any time, it does mention that it is uh, relatively lawless, and that I think it even mentions something about the, the drug operation there. After avoiding the orbital patrols, you and Flynn quickly move through the facility, smashing and killing everything you come across. Flynn is just a whirling dirge of destruction, and whenever you find yourself getting pinned down, he somehow manages to pull off the impossible and pull you out of trouble. After the better part of an hour of fighting your way through the crashed ship, everything is quiet, and Flynn plants his charges, and the two of you take off as soon as possible to avoid any further entanglement with pirate goons. And if we read the blurb here, a sparsely populated planet, Merim is breathtakingly beautiful, cold, and often dangerous. Merim is home to a brave few who eke out a living hunting the sleek ice cats that live on the steppes. Few ships land here, and those who do are welcomed indifferently by the aloof hunters and their families. There is no official government, and taxes have not been collected here since the last census. And if we go to the trade center here, the ice cat pelts are low. That is a special trade good. There is somewhere else in the galaxy that will buy those for high. All right, let's deal with this Thunderhead, just to get some combat in. As you can see, we actually do pretty well. Now, can we take out this carrier is going to be the other question. Rick is to stay behind it. Preferably get it with this Thunderhead beam. Yep, Thunderhead lance, rather. Now, these escorts should... Um, try to run away at this point. I will refuse to get disabled by a pirate viper. That would just be sad. Now, you can't board these as they are uh, storyline ships. So if we try with this pirate carrier, which is probably the easiest one to do at the moment, it's just going to tell us that uh, it's not, not boardable. See, in the lower left-hand corner it says you cannot board this ship. But that's fine. So now we're just going to zip back to New Ireland and get on with it. We are going to have to land to recharge just because we did use some fuel there with our afterburner. So we'll set down on Seoul and top ourselves off. Okay. And now it's just a quick jaunt down to New Ireland. This is kind of a fun mission. Uh, you can definitely do the entire thing without doing any combat. It's easy enough to run the blockade as it were and land on those planets without having to fight the orbital patrol. You land on New Ireland with the memory of your assault on the south of the border still fresh in your mind. You and the wild geese team to move through the derelict like wraiths of death itself. The workers tried to repulse you with small arms fire from numerous blasters, and the sentinel gun encampment slowed you down for a while, but nothing could stop Flynn. His heavy repeating blasters spat an unending stream of destruction, and soon enough it was time for the up-close fighting. In battle, Flynn became a wild killing machine, hacking and slashing without fear. Men fell before him like wheat before the scythe, and many turned and tried to flee. Flynn pulled his pistol, and he and his team wrecked a bloody vengeance upon their massed ranks, and it was over in less than an hour. You looked out the porthole and watched the survivors flee across the icy steps, safe in the knowledge that the extreme cold would soon end their lives. Remember standing guard while Flynn quickly set a number of microfusion charges before both of you returned to the pirate's bounty. As you passed over the site, Flynn depressed the detonator, and the entire wreck disappeared in a ball of white light, rapidly expanding to a sphere of flaming debris. The Hulk was simply vaporized. You and Flynn report the details of your assault to Fl uh, Flanagan, who grins happily at the result. That should upset our friend McGowan somewhat, he says a little cheekily. He just lost a sizable portion of his drug production capacity. It took him almost a year to set up that site, and it took the two of you and a strike team an hour or so to utterly destroy it. Wait for me in the bar. I'll have something else for you to do in a few hours. So, fairly successful. Uh, what is also worth pointing out is that the wild geese have their own variant of the lightning ship. 
So I'll read the blurb here. While the basic Ritharian Lightning is an excellent ship in its own right, the Wild Geese needed more. They needed a ship capable of operating as a top-rate fighter, as well as having the firepower of a gunboat. The vessel that came the closest was the Lightning, so the Wild Geese bought a production license from the Ritharian Company and began improving on the basic design. Or along, the Wild Geese version of the Lightning was born, and it was everything they could have hoped for. As an added bonus, the Wild Geese version is available without any requirements for a license. However, to restock her missile tubes, after you've depleted them, you will have to acquire a license to purchase more. Though true to form, it does have an IR missile launcher, and for that you will need a miss missile weapons license to get more ammo. But really you buy it for, I think, the Thunderhead Lance and the Speed. These things are pretty zippy. So, you are sitting waiting for Flanagan, and Flynn has been telling you all about his recent adventures. You do a lot of flying, but Flynn has been from one end of the universe to the other so many times that it would have easily eclipsed your journeys. All of his missions involve some sort of espionage, from destroying installations to planting bugs and wires in crucial places. You are beginning to get a grasp of how large the Wild Geese Intelligence Network is, and you ask Flynn how the geese maintain such a high level of security and awareness in what is a constantly changing world. That's simple, he says, sipping his pint. We geese come from a long line of usurpers. Our ancestors fought in so many wars after being forced into exile for their political ideologies that we have almost evolved into the unit we are now. While some people tell their wains about the three little bugbears or the princess bride, we get told stories about Michael Collins and the flying column or the battle of Rory of the Glen. Guerrilla tactics are like mother's milk to us. Intelligence and counterintelligence are easy if you've been trained in them since you've been able to listen. You are still musing over this information when Flanagan arrives. He quickly walks up to you and pulls you into a booth. Now we are going to play a little game. Gowan has placed orders with a number of smaller operations for drugs. In a few hours, we'll have a shipment for you to deliver. Only thing is, your containers aren't going to be filled with hammerhead, or fly, or goof juice. They're going to be packed with explosives. Since the orders are being filled by so many groups, it has been easy for our spies to discover what the passwords and delivery schedules are. Do you want to make some evil men go boom? Sure do. Good for you. Here's the deal. We'll load the containers onto your ship. You have to take them to Rill in the Portarilla system. McGowan has a distribution center there. When you arrive, tell the dock workers that the containers are for Margetta Harris. They'll ask when you want them delivered, and you must respond with before 6 tomorrow and make it snappy. If you don't, they will assume that you are a plant and more than likely try to kill you. Even if you escape, you'll have a hold full of explosives to get rid of, so make sure you have it right. Get the shipment there ASAP, as I'll need to make McGowan sweat in order to take my plans to the next phase. Also, he adds with a quiet grin, you might want to avoid Federation patrols, as I don't think they appreciate people who ship large amounts of explosives from place to place. Any questions? You tell Flanagan that you have it, and head for your ship. So, this is one that is kind of fun. Uh, Portorillo is a pretty rough part of the galaxy. And it's all the way up here in the Galactic North, just six jumps away. I believe we'll probably have to stop and refuel if that's the case. We'll stop in Nurse Secondus. Oh no, we should be fine. I always forget how much energy we have on this thing. It's pretty great. The Mod Star Bridge is a very capable ship. Not quite on the level of the Pirate Valkyrie Mark IV, but it's certainly enough to get you through any storyline if you don't feel like you want to upgrade. You land on Rill to find the docks a swarm of activity. You wonder how the corrupt dock workers know which ships to approach, but you guess that Flanagan and the Geese have made sure that the shipping scripts have been organized to match. A number of burly dock workers approach you, and with a poker face, you tell them that the containers are to be delivered to Margetta Harris. When asked what time the goods must be delivered, you tell the foreman before 6 tomorrow and make it snappy. The foreman grins and hands you a chip for 30,000 credits. There you go, he says smiling. A little bonus from the boss for a prompt delivery. You smile, more at the irony of the situation, but the dim-witted foreman does not notice the difference. You head back to your ship to get some rest and watch the news. A couple of hours later, the broadcast you are watching is interrupted for a special report. You watch in grim satisfaction as a news reporter makes a telecast from the front of a burning warehouse. Great gouts of black oily smoke billow from the building, and the reporter has to shout to be heard over the roar of the flames. Switching off the hollow receiver, you head for the stars, and ultimately, New Ireland. So there you go. We're just going to pick up a map here because I notice this northern part of space is not too fleshed out on this pilot. But Portorillo is interesting. It has a 
ruined hypergate here, and it, the it's very murky. So as you can see, the ships and the uh, various things fade into the background as you get further away from them. If you do not have an appropriate sensor boost on your ship, this will actually affect the effectiveness of your mini map up top. It'll, it'll like flash with static. Luckily, we have a pretty good one. We have the pirate one, and so that is not a problem for us. I think we're going to cut this here. We're going to make this a two-part little mini series. So thank you for joining me. If you found this interesting, please go ahead and check out some of the other storylines we have up here on the channel for major storylines to other side missions. If you liked something in particular, please let me know in the comments below. And whatever you decide to do, until next time, I hope you have a good one.